I'm so excited to introduce today's guest. She's an absolute chess legend. She was the youngest grandmaster ever when she became a grandmaster. She became one of the top 100 chess players in the world as a 12-year-old. She's beaten seven different world champions. She wrote my favorite chess book. And we've been studying her chess all month and all of last month. I could not possibly be any more excited to introduce Judith Polgar. And I would like to uh, tell a little bit about my story, about my childhood, how I grew up. And then I'd like to show you some of my games from my early childhood. So you can, you can also feel that I was little and I won maybe in simple ways, but you have to start from somewhere, right? I liked very much creating my own puzzle. So I created this puzzle myself because I like tactics very much. And when I was little, I was uh, making, creating patterns and mating nets. That's what I liked very much. So first I would like to ask you, how can white win? White has a rook down, but at the same time, white has lots of knights over looking over the king. And yes, George and Go is excellent, excellent, and Anish. Exactly. The movie is Queen H6. And this is possible because the G7, Queen G7 threatening with the mate. So if knight E6 defending the pawn, then Queen H7 would be checkmate. So that's why black has to be capturing the queen. Then I go G7 check. The only move is going out with the king and knight h6 checkmate. I always love to play with knights because I consider, and that's my favorite piece, I think uh, that's the most unexpected piece. There were many games where I was using my knight as a magic. So there is one quiet move. Wow. Jet, there is uh, someone who is excellent and very good. Yeah, this is the cool move to play rook e5. And uh, what's the reason? The reason the threat is to go rook h5. Let's say black goes queen g8. I'm just showing the example. And uh, this game I was playing in, uh, in Argentina at the under 16 world championship with girls. I was less than 10 years old. I have a great position with black and there are many different ways of improving the position. But actually I can suggest to you that even if you have a winning position, you have to be extremely careful not to ruin it. Knight f3 is something the most obvious, right? I see some of you were suggesting f3. That's also good. So what is it, knight f3 or f3? If knight f3, this was a kind of a trap from my opponent because after knight f3, Bishop takes, e takes f3, and queen g2 is a threat with a mate, right? But white can go queen d3 check, and after that, he can capture the pawn on f3. And actually, I would not even win the game. But f3 is the right move. White has to go bishop f1, because otherwise, queen on g2 would give mate. And now you have to deflect the bishop. We have a great knight on d4, so it's possible to do that, right? And I played knight e2, which after my opponent resigned, because if bishop e2, then queen g2 mate. Sometimes if you don't know what to, to, how to continue, maybe it's worth just observing how your pieces are standing. And if it's not standing in a perfect spot, you try to visualize it where it would be actually better standing. I'm playing with the white pieces, exactly. And uh, I visualized it that, okay, my rook stands on the seventh rank. I'm pretty sure Danielle was telling you all about the power of the seventh rank rook. You see my bishop is very powerful, is cutting the squares away from the king. It's much more powerful than the black bishop. And we shouldn't even talk about the beautiful a8 knight, which is still lovely because at least black can say that he or she has a knight, right? But it's not something that the black can be proud of. And I have my knight and I have my aim to get to c6. 
And then the A8 knight can never get out of there. Very sad knight. I completely agree. I completely, very sad. She played her first two games wearing the sweater on the first day, and she won both games. And then my mother was taking away while I was sleeping to wash my sweater, but I had to wear the same sweater the third day, and I won my two games again. And in the last, on the fourth day, I won my first game, but the last game I made a draw because it was enough for me to win the tournament. Do you still have your lucky sweater somewhere? It's awful, but I don't know where it is. It's a, it's, it's, I'm very sad about it. But I have my lion. I can show you. I have my lion. <laughs> there, there were many, uh, many questions about whether or not she still had the lion. Oh, there Here's it is. my lion. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is it. It's a little injured here in the nose, but and my husband is a vet, but I didn't ask him to fix it. What do you recommend is the best way to become a better chess player? How many games can you play at the same time blindfolded? What do you do when you're losing? Is competitive chess stressful? Did you ever reach a plateau when you're chess learning? Basically, a period when your level stayed the same, or you had a bunch of losses in a row? And if so, did you ever get frustrated? How did you get past it mentally? Who is your favorite person you played against? Did you beat Bobby Fischer? Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure to, to see you asking questions. I hope I could uh, share some things which can be useful for you in your chess and to inspire you for your upcoming events and to continue to be passionate about the game.